You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who Art Ed? Who tried to spice it? Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's <laughs> ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, weekly art history for all ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today we're looking at the life and work of Helen Frankenthaler. Now, Helen Frankenthaler was born in Manhattan, New York, December 12, 1928. It's said that as a child, she would walk to the museum drawing a chalk line from her apartment to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I have to imagine as she walked that path, she dreamed of one day having her work housed in their incredible collection. And today, of course, the Met does have a number of works by Helen Frankenthaler. But that would come later. Now, Helen was the third daughter born to a family with the financial means to nurture her creativity. Her father was a prominent judge on the New York State Supreme Court, and her mother had some unfulfilled dreams of becoming an artist herself. Growing up, the family would travel, instilling a love for landscapes, sea, and sky. Young Helen showed a talent for art in conventional painting and drawing, but also in some unexpected ways. There's a story that as a child, Helen Frankenthaler poured her mother's nail polish down the sink to watch the colors flow. Now, I do have to say, for any children listening, please don't do that. It's horribly wasteful and probably bad for the pipes. Nail polish remover can destroy pipes and even cause an explosion if poured down the drain, and some nail polishes are considered hazardous waste which really raises questions about why they are used in beauty products, but maybe that should be covered another day in one of my October not-so-fun-fact horror episodes like Killer Wallpaper or The Radium Girls. For now, let's just say her pouring the nail polish to watch the color swirl was cute foreshadowing, but if any young listeners want to conduct similar experiments, please just use watercolors. Helen's parents nurtured that creative spirit by sending her to the finest schools around. She attended the prestigious Dalton School. At 15, she studied under the Mexican painter Rufino Tomeo. While Tomeo's contemporaries like Diego Rivera produced politically charged works, Tomeo's work had a broad appeal as he focused on more neutral, tranquil, and joyous subjects. He had grown up raised by a successful fruit vendor, and in many of his paintings, he focused on watermelons, pineapples, and other fruits and symbols of abundance and pleasure. Under Tomeo, Frankenthaler learned to paint a still life, but I have to imagine that tone, focusing on beauty, had a lasting impact on her conception of the meaning and purpose of art. While many of her contemporaries in the abstract expressionist movement were largely focused on the internal world of their emotions, ideas, and their personal idiosyncratic movements, Frankenthaler's work was a little bit more outward-looking. And as she talked about her work in numerous interviews, she would talk about finding the beauty. Her pieces call to mind landscapes with names like Mountains and Sea or The Bay, which we'll dive into a little later. By the age of 16, she was determined to be an artist and enrolled in Bennington College in Vermont. There, she studied under Paul Freely, who was a big fan of Picasso. He was also sort of influential in the New York abstract expressionist scene, helping to put together collections and exhibitions. At Bennington, she was taught to paint in that modern style of cubism, and for a little while, she was kind of doing stuff in that vein. In 1948, after years of study and practice honing her skills as a painter, she moved back to New York. Frankenthaler immediately immersed herself in the art scene with a small, intense circle of artists and critics who would come to define art for a generation. In 1950, she began dating the critic Clement Greenberg. Greenberg was highly respected despite being generally disrespectful towards everyone around him. He was passionate and forceful in his writings about art. 
He spoke with a confidence that made it hard to question his assertions, and he was an early champion of Jackson Pollock, so most people just kind of assumed he knew what he was talking about and trusted his authority. Unfortunately, he was known to be combative and apparently couldn't turn off the critic side of himself, even keeping a notebook critiquing his girlfriend's physical appearance. Ugh. While I imagine a lot of that time was awful, he definitely helped her career. It was Greenberg who introduced Frankenthaler to Jackson Pollock and Hans Hoffman, two more men who, to put it generously, are never going to be described as feminists. Hoffman is said to have commented on the work of Lee Krasner, another great modern painter, saying, quote, This is so good you wouldn't know a woman painted it. End quote. I think that statement really summarizes the tone of the New York art scene in the 1950s and what Helen Frankenthaler was up against. In 1952, after visiting Jackson Pollock's studio, Frankenthaler said she felt compelled to adopt his method of painting on the floor. By moving the painting off the easel and encountering the canvas as a horizontal plane, she could work differently as gravity no longer worked against the piece. She would lift and tilt the canvas on occasion to introduce an element of chance, but she retained some control over the drips. Of course, Jackson Pollock was the one who had become famous for his drip painting method. So the question for a lot of people might be, how could you move further into abstraction than dripping paint? The next logical evolution beyond a drip would have to be a pour. On October 26, 1952, Helen Frankenthaler walked from her apartment to her studio on West 23rd Street. The quiet loft space had skylights over a giant 7 by 10 foot unprimed canvas rolled out over the floor. Typically, artists would prime a canvas covering the surface to prevent paint from bleeding directly into the fibers. Priming smooths the surface, it helps preserve the canvas and makes the surface less absorbent so the paint will spread a bit more easily. Frankenthaler would later say, She must have been eager to get straight to work. In a combination of, as she put it, quote, laziness, impatience, and innovation, decided, why not put it on straight, end quote. But she didn't start putting the paint on straight. She started with charcoal drawing. They were loose sketches alluding to a landscape, but just the hint of the forms that would surely be developed later. She thinned her paints with turpentine and began to spread them over the surface. She watched the paint flow as it pooled and soaked into the fibers of the canvas. The result was something wholly new. The aptly titled Mountains and Sea is a hazy sort of landscape. On the right side, we see abstracted forms clearly in line with the title and inspiration for the work. Um, It was inspired by a visit to Nova Scotia. And then, as we look across the painting, to the left, the mountains and sea seem to dissolve into pure abstraction. The landscape washed away in a flood of paint and turpentine. Or perhaps, if we read from left to right, the scattered elements on the left begin to come together and take form, building to become mountains and sea. The bleed and the uneven marks of the pooling paint were a revelation, and this painting, Mountains and Sea from 1952, is now considered Helen Frankenthaler's masterpiece. Well, it's probably just one of many, certainly the first in this line of work. It was a big painting, like I said, 7 by 10 feet, but its influence on other artists was absolutely enormous. She allowed people to see a whole new way of painting. It was a style Greenberg dubbed post-painterly abstraction, although it's more commonly referred to as color field painting. While Mountains and Sea is considered a masterpiece today, it took a little time for the general public to appreciate it. Frankenthaler knew she was onto something. She never doubted her work. Clement Greenberg brought other Abex painters to her studio to see it, and they loved it. But when Frankenthaler put it in a show, 
it and pretty much all of her other works went unsold. I think it was priced at only like $100 or something like that, and today it'd be valued in the millions. Now, after the break, we'll go a little further into her life and her work with The Bay from 1963. Helen Frankenthaler found success fairly early in life. She was just 24 years old when she painted Mountains and Sea, the breakthrough work demonstrating her soak and stain method. While the piece wasn't initially a commercial success, it did resonate with critics and other artists. A few years later, in 1958, she met the artist Robert Motherwell, and that same year the two were married. Other artists, probably a bit jealous of their success and good fortune, would sometimes refer to Frankenthaler and Motherwell as the golden couple. While many of the abstract expressionists struggled financially for some period, I mean, there are stories of Jackson Pollock needing to steal food just to survive, Frankenthaler and Motherwell both came from wealthy families. They were known for throwing extravagant parties, and they were pretty quick to find success. By just her mid to late 20s, Helen Frankenthaler had the kind of success few attain after a lifetime of struggle, and it's safe to say there was some amount of jealousy. Of course, in reducing her biography to just the highlights, we could construct very different stories. She may have been the golden child, the youngest of three daughters, born to a wealthy and prominent family who sent her to all the best schools. Then she was introduced to influential critics and artists to set her on a glide path to success. We could also see her as a tragic figure. Her father, the prominent judge, passed away when she was just 11 years old, and her mother died by suicide when Helen was 25. After losing both her parents, she was left to find success on her own in an industry that was all too dismissive of the accomplishments of women. The truth is probably some mix of both, along with several other elements that we'll never even know about. Her life story, much like her work, has some bits that feel distinctive and give us a clue as to what may be going on, but ultimately, our interpretation can be more about what we're looking to find within the work. The Bay was painted in 1963 as Frankenthaler had refined her soak and stain process, and it was selected as one of the works for the American Pavilion in the 1966 Venice Biennial. While Mountains and Sea was made with diluted oil paints, the bay is acrylic on unprimed canvas. She had found that using acrylics gave her greater control over the viscosity or how fluid the paint was. The bay is a series of washes of blues and greens, organic shapes that flow peacefully. I personally always love a good blue monochrome. For me, the combination of Prussian blue and cerulean is so satisfyingly harmonious, it's the visual equivalent of ASMR. In the bay, I see a range of blues, looking like indigo and ultramarine, mixed wet on wet and allowed to flow seamlessly into one another. But that organic pool of blue seems suspended in front of a more muted green and brown. Her successful color modulation to create a hint of depth reminds me of Hans Hoffmann's push-pull color theory. The more saturated blues seem to pull forward in the picture plane as the more muted colors seem to recede into the background, which is on some level creating a bit of visual tension because generally atmospheric perspective would tell us that blue should recede because things farther away will look more pale and blue because of how light scatters through the atmosphere. There's a little bit of this figure ground play because the ambiguity of the shapes rolling off the edges of the canvas and variations in color saturation. When I look from a distance, the blue is out in front, but as my eye travels around the composition, there are instances where the green can feel like it's out in front of the blue. Looking at the edges of the shapes, we can see the blue bleeding into the green, a clear indication this paint was poured while the canvas was still wet. There's an element of chance here, but 
It's what some might refer to as sprezzatura, a studied carelessness. Frankenthaler gives the paint a little room to flow, to pool, to bleed, but within her parameters. As she said, quote, I think accidents are lucky only if you know how to use them, end quote. As I look at the bay, the title indicates a landscape, and the brightness, the organic shapes of blue and green, give me a sense of a bay. But more, it feels like it's about a happy, contented sort of a tone. There's movement, but it seems gentle, like sitting out on a boat drifting in calm waters. This was painted about five years into her marriage to Robert Motherwell, and I see it as a reflection of her happiness and inspiration from their partnership and their travels. Later in life, Helen Frankenthaler was asked if she could revisit one period in her life, what would it be? And she responded, the first few years with Bob. The Bay represents a different sort of take on abstract expressionism. While many followed Jackson Pollock's and Willem de Kooning's aggressive and angsty style, Helen Frankenthaler's color fields are more gentle and at peace. Her work was a breath of fresh air, showing that painting could reduce art to the fundamental elements in line with esoteric modernist philosophy and still be beautiful and joyous. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.